Hi everybody, Mike Uyak here. So I know we're all kind of stuck inside right now and times are kind of tough. Can't get out, go out to dinner, and you're stuck doing takeout. But that gets expensive after a while, after all. And, you know, there's still a little bit of a risk of uh, exposing yourself to other people. So, a lot of us are taking to experimenting in the kitchen, which I, congr I congratulate you for. That, that is a good thing. You're trying new things. Um, but some of you are trying your own home cooking for the very first time. And so, for at least some of you, some condolences are in order. <laughs> um... I don't know who may be seeing this, but some of you, I know because I've met some of you, some of you can't boil water. Um, so if you want to learn how to cook and you can't take a cooking class right now, um, I would like to offer my services to at least discuss some of the fundamentals. Um, one of the first things that we need to talk about is gear. Uh, you can't cook anything unless you have something to cook it on or to prepare the ingredients. So the most important set of tools in your kitchen should be your knives. Now when discussing knives you really should have at least a couple, preferably more, to deal with all the different types of food that you might be preparing. Now if you're the type of person who's been doing TV dinners then you don't need too many knives. but if you're really interested in cooking for yourself, there are a few knives that you need to have. Now, me, because I grew up in an Asian household, the cleaver pretty much does everything. It is a uh, all-purpose slicer, chopper. I have filleted fish with it. I have deboned. I have actually deboned meats with it. Believe it or not, uh, it serves as a bench scraper. It's everything. I'm. This is what I'm used to. Um, if you're not actually particularly used to anything, you should probably invest in a regular chef's knife. They often term it a French knife or a French style chef knife. Um, straight back knife, tapered edge. Uh, this is a little larger than a typical home chef's knife. This is, I think, a 12 inch blade. Typically, you'll get an 8 or I would recommend a 10 inch. Uh, chef's knife. It's long enough that you can actually deal with pretty much whatever you've got. Um, not so long that it gets in the way uh, and, and it gives you a fair amount of leverage when you're cutting down onto some, some harder things like carrots and um, really hard really hard melons and things like that. Now some of the things to look for um, I recommend I recommend stainless steel. Uh, some people have carbon steel, which is really nice. But if you don't take really really good care of carbon steel, it can rust really quickly. Stainless um, is a lot less, uh, a lot more forgiving. We'll say a lot less maintenance, and just gen generally speaking, is good enough for the average home cook. There are also ceramic knives out there. I think they're kind of gimmicky. They work fine. Um, they um, they're able they, they come to you honed to a razor's edge they hold the edge for a very long time but because they're ceramic you can't sharpen them um, you have to send them back to the factory to be resharpened because it's it's a ceramic if you tried to just sharpen it you'd probably chip it worse than it already is um, I look for what they call full tang construction which means that the portion of the the uh, metal blade that gets drawn out to be part of the handle is the full length of the handle and then the, the, the handle material is in this case is, is actually molded around it or in the case of some of these more um, consumer grade knives um, you'll see I don't know if you can see this but basically the tang of the knife is sandwiched between two halves of the handle material and then they're riveted into place. These are fine too. Um, these are a little bit uh, cheaper and as a result of cheaper quality. It's a, it's a lower quality of steel um, but they're, they're good enough for consumer use and these are fine too. For storage 
a countertop uh, uh, knife block is okay. Usually you'll either able to buy a set, usually comes with um, a chef's knife, uh, some sort of serrated knife, uh, some sort of boning knife, and maybe some steak knives or something like that. Um, it's perfectly fine, and, and as, a, as for, for a starter, it's a perfectly fine thing. Um, this is more of a professional. This is, this is actually Chris's uh, chef's knife from cooking school, so um, this is a higher grade. Um, and you pay a commensurate price for it. Um, but full tank construction, um, you want this, you want a nice sort of well-balanced knife and it, it needs to feel comfortable in the hand. So, you know, I would definitely, when going shopping for a knife, try it out, see how it feels in the hand if it's, if it's solid. Now, how to hold a knife. Um, do not just grasp it around the handle like so, like with a fist. Um, don't do underhand, unless you're knife fighting. Uh, don't do any of that. P pinch it between thumb and forefinger, like this first knuckle of your forefinger, and your thumb, like so. And then wrap the rest of your fingers around the handle. Now the reason that you do that is because now the blade can't twist. If you were to just grab it like a f uh, with a fist, and let's say you were cutting something um, kind of substantial, like a really thick carrot or something like that, and you came at it at a slightly different angle, or at, at an angle and you, you weren't paying attention, there's the possibility the knife could rotate in your hand, could spin around or slip, and now you don't have control over where that edge is going. If you're putting a lot of pressure on it, you might end up slipping and slicing something on you instead of on the cutting board that would be bad. So by holding it in this pinch grip, you have more control over the blade. There's less likelihood that you can actually, that you'll slip and cut yourself uh, this way. Now, uh, we'll get into how to actually cut things in a moment. I'm just talking about the types of knives. Now in your, your butcher block or your knife block, you might see one of these. This is a honing steel. You have probably, if you're interested in cooking videos, you've probably already seen uh, presentations like this. This will not sharpen a knife. I want to repeat that again. This does not sharpen anything. Don't let anybody call it a sharpening steel, because it's not. Um, what ends up happening, I'm going to show you on this knife. So on my cleaver, what ends up happening is along the edge, as you use it, and especially if you're whacking into things that are kind of hard, or just through use, um, the blade itself, because it's sharpened down to a nice thin edge, um, the edge might bend a little, one way or the other, and so that edge will not be true. And what ends up happening is, if especially if you're trying to slice, and you have a wavy line for the edge of the blade. It's not going to cut straight. Um, it, it, it's just going to feel dull. When it's not actually dull, it's out of alignment. It is not honed. So you take this piece of steel and you run the blade along it at the bevel angle of the, of the blade. And what it does is it straightens out all of those little wavy bits and brings it back to true. It doesn't actually sharpen it, it just makes it so it's more effective at the sharpness level that it's at. Once the knife is dull, once you've actually put enough basically microscopic chips into the, into the knife's edge, uh, no amount of honing will actually make it any sharper. That's when you need to sharpen it. And if you're not experienced at actually sharpening blades, the best bet is to actually take it into someone who will do it. There are some grocery some you should probably ask um, the butcher counter at your grocery store. Some of them will actually sharpen your blades for you for a fee. Um, otherwise, uh, you can look up and look up online. There are uh, businesses in your area that professionally sharpen knives for restaurants and whatnot, and they do it for you know, private, private consumers as well. Get one of them to do it. Um, otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort trying to sharpen your knives and maybe succeeding, maybe not, if you don't know how. So, some other knives. We've already talked about the chef's knife. Uh, 
a good serrated knife is good to have um, for things like crusty breads uh, and smooth, smooth skinned uh, fruits and vegetables, things like tomatoes. Um, a good uh, serrated knife with that scalloped edge is really useful. Um, it can really dig in and catch those really smooth surfaces. Um, really good for sawing through things like, like I said, like crusty bread, uh, like a good round of sourdough or something like that. They don't dull very quickly. They hold their edge for a long time just because you have all these scallops have, have a cutting surface. So aside from the tip of each of these scallops, um, those, will, those will get dull over time, but the sort of interior curvature of them, of each of those scallops, will stay sharp for longer because they're protected by that tip. Um, eventually you will need to actually get these sharpened. Um, again, especially with these, um, it's easier to just get them professionally done, but good to have around. Uh, filleting and or boning knife. These are useful. Um, usually you know maintained super super sharp so that you can get nice clean cuts on pieces of meat that you're removing from bones um, including you know filleting fish uh, deboning chicken or beef or whatever very very useful not absolutely vital but really really nice to have the thin blade means that there's less surface area to stick on the meat so I don't know if you've ever tried cutting a piece of meat with a larger blade, the broader blade, um, once, the, once you get down past the actual edge of the knife, the broader blade is just a surface for the meat to stick to, and you have that piece of meat that's just moving back and forth with the knife, and you're not actually cutting very efficiently because the knife isn't going, isn't moving relative to the meat. The meat is moving along with it. So a boning and or filleting knife very, very useful. Uh, steak knives. Paring knives. Small, usually on the four to six inch range. Um, good for paring. Uh, small vegetables, if you're, if you're peeling things, it was the original thing before they invented vegetable peelers and it's still useful for that uh, today. Um, smaller items, you know, if you're cutting cherry tomatoes, this is a little overkill, but <laughs> this is fine. Um, and for any sort of detail work that you need that you need to do useful to have and there are dozens and dozens of other knives that you might might possibly need to buy you know, clamming and oyster knives um, the worst prison shiv ever is so blunt you're basically poking people to death but anyway um, this is an example of not a great knife for cooking um, this is a pretty good knife for um, well, assassinations, really. <laughs> uh, I love this thing because uh, there's a lot of heart that went into this. Chris has a friend who uh, is a horseshoer, blacksmith, and he decided that when he heard that Chris was going to uh, cooking school, that he would make her a chef's knife. And he made Sting here. Uh, it's very heavy. And to him, because he's just pounding away on horseshoes and, you know, using five pound sledges on things all day long. This didn't feel like anything. This probably feels like, you know, you know a paper clip to him. Um, so he doesn't, he didn't really know that uh, the balance isn't good. It's, it's very, 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 it's very heavy, first of all, but it's also heavy toward the front. Um, the blade is very, very broad and you know, you, it, you're going to be exhausted using this for more than a few minutes. But this thing does a great number on chocolate, on bars of chocolate. So I, we've kept it around one because it was it was a really sweet thought for for him to actually try to do make this for her, um, and uh, for for just sheer blunt force chopping of stuff. This actually does a pretty decent job. So we kept it around. Now, take a look down here. Let's talk maintenance for a moment. Uh, you want to talk about your cutting surface. I have a nice uh, composite board, cutting board here. And also, I like to put it on, basically this is some of that foam. 
um, sort of sticky foam stuff they use for uh, like futon mattresses and stuff like that to keep them from sliding around. Also works for cutting boards. The, alternatively, you could just use a dish towel for this. Um, when you're cutting, when you're cutting stuff, you want a wood or a plastic surface to cut cut on. Um, it's hard enough to actually withstand whatever you're doing, but it's soft enough that it's not going to actually damage the edge of your knife. Um, you want to make sure that it's a, a nice, solid, but flat surface. Don't do it on your countertop. Don't, don't cut things on your countertop. If it's cheap, like the linoleum countertop that I have, you'll cut you'll leave cut marks in your linoleum. If it's harder, if you've got stainless steel or marble or concrete or any sort of harder con uh, harder countertop like that, um, you'll possibly still scratch your countertop, but more sort of more importantly, I guess for this discussion, you'll blunt your knives. Um, don't put these into the dishwasher. Um, again, rattling around against all your other uh, all your other cutlery and everything will probably um, blunt it. And if it's not a really good stainless steel, you could still actually cause more corrosion by putting it into that environment. Wash them carefully by hand, and store them in your knife block or a magnetic or like a magnetic knife holder on the wall. We have that for some of our knives. Um, yeah, definitely don't store this in a drawer for the exact same reason you don't put it in the dishwasher. Um, and actually additional reasons. So just think of all the other tools that you've got in your, uh, you know, in your utensil drawer with all your whisks and uh, can openers and all of that. You're potentially, you know, running this edge up against those other metal parts could blunt the knife. Also, if you're anything like me, if you're looking for a tool because you really, really need it right now because you didn't think to bring it out before you needed it, now all of a sudden you're pawing around in that drawer and sure enough, you grab the knife here and it's a much longer day for you all of a sudden. So don't put it in a drawer, put it someplace where it's easy to get to, um, but out of the way so you're not gonna accidentally grab the blade for some reason. Uh, now. If you haven't done a lot of cutting, if you haven't prepped uh, ingredients for cooking, then I suggest practice. Practice makes perfect, right? So, let's take a look at this onion here. I'm going to move the cutting board a little closer to the camera so you can see what the heck I'm doing. Got a nice little red onion here. Just practice. So again, grasp between thumb and forefinger, wrap the rest of your fingers, around the handle, nice and secure. Take your onion, use some leverage, peel off the paper, like so. I always cut off this little bit because it's usually papery. Now, the classical technique is to leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board as much as possible. So if it's waving around, there's a possibility that things could get under it. So uh, try to kind of do all your cutting in this motion. With the food basically getting under this end of the knife. And this way, this sort of orbital motion like this or like a reciprocating motion, means that as you cut down, you're not just doing like a paper cutter, you're actually slicing as the knife comes down. So the knife has a chance to cut as it goes through. So it's re you're really slicing, you're not chopping. So, let's see if I can do this the sideways here so you can actually see what I'm doing. So for dicing an onion, first off, you take it, Nice and slow, take your time. And whenever you're cutting things, you're using your dominant hand to hold the knife and your non-dominant hand, keep your fingers curled under so that really it's just your fingertips that are sort of holding the, the vegetable or whatever it is you're cutting, holding it down. And so you're using these knuckles to guide the knife as it goes up and down. So 
the worst thing that can happen if you you know you lose your concentration or something the worst thing that can happen is the knife gets up a little too high and you kind of shave off uh, the tops of these two knuckles that's probably the worst thing that can happen here if you're keeping your you know keeping your fingers curled your thumb tucked out of the way and you're just holding the vegetables down or whatever you're cutting down with your fingertips like this so I'm cutting through nice and slow and the tip I don't know if you can see this the tip is just barely not quite going all the way through it's just so, so that the onion stays intact as I'm slicing it go through this way now as we know onions come in layers so what happens is as I dice this I'm slicing it this way you know maybe quarter inch there we go maybe a quarter inch slices and then I turn it 90 degrees and when I cut it this way what's going to happen is I'm going to have pieces come on you I'm going to have pieces the thickness of each of these layers um, it is possible to cut these smaller but generally speaking you're not going to need to do that so again nice orbital motion keeping my fingers curled slice down like so and then just slowly move your way up the onion move your non-dominant hand the one holding the vegetable as necessary to keep it out of the way and slice And you know that little bit at the end in order to save your fingers throw it away it's an onion it's cheap so you end up with a nice thin even dice so what about larger or harder vegetables like carrots well if you need to dice these the process is basically the same you just have to be a little bit more careful because it's it's harder you're going to have to exert more force in order to cut it when dicing carrots, I like to cut them into more manageable sizes. This is the only sort of, not really dangerous part, but a, a little bit less certain part because you've got a nice, you got a round thing that can roll on you while you're trying to cut it. So I like to get started. So now the knife is holding the carrot. Um, I like to get started on it and then move my hand out of the way and actually put it up above to sort of hold the blade down and give me a little extra give me a little extra leverage pushing down on the knife and then push down through the carrot like so now, that wasn't very even but you get the idea um, matter of fact I'm gonna do another one just to demonstrate and that way your fingers are not actually un anywhere near the underside of that blade you're a lot safer now you have a cut surface, you have a nice flat surface. It's a little easier to keep it stable, cut down through it. And then turn it 90 degrees and dicing it is exactly the same process. A nice orbital motion as you feed the carrot through. And you know you're not a professional chef remember that you're not a professional chef so whenever you see you know so, someone some celebrity chef on TV and they're doing this don't sweat it professional chefs are people one they've trained for years and years and years to do that so they can cut up vegetables in their sleep and often have um, and or they're showing off they do that because they can not because they should so don't worry about taking a little bit extra time to be safe um, even if you're in a hurry uh, there is nothing so vital that you have to rush uh, and forego safety I mean unless you're a fireman I guess um, 
and as you get more experience, you can practice on it and get a little faster. But I wouldn't worry about being a human Cuisinart. But what you should do is practice. The only way to get better is to continue doing it. So just get yourself a cutting board, get yourself a good knife, and sit down and just chop up a big bag of carrots or whatever. Just get some practice at it. And you'll get better. I promise. And yes, you will probably cut yourself a couple times. That's okay. Get a band-aid. And then get back to cutting vegetables. So if I had to choose, no, me personally, if I had to choose, uh, I would say, well, my cleaver for pretty much everything and serrated knife for pretty much everything else. Maybe a paring knife. Uh, if I had, if I personally had to choose, you should definitely have a chef's knife. Again, probably not this long. Look for one eight to ten inches, and a paring knife, um, and a serrated knife would would be nice. Um, not absolutely necessary. If you absolutely had to, you could get by with just your chef's knife. Um, it's just a little bit more awkward in some functions than others. Uh, later on, if you decide to expand your knife collection, uh, get into other styles of cooking, there are all sorts of knives and special, specialized knives, but in general, two or three will probably do you for 99% of the cooking that, you'll, that you're going to be doing. And, um, you know, take good care of them and you can pass them on to your kids because they, they last for a long, long time if you take care of them. So, lessons learned. Uh, take care of your knives. Look for full tang construction. Stainless steel is good. Ceramics, okay. Don't buy plastic knives. There, there are some. They're ridiculous. Um, stainless steel is what I recommend. Carbon steel is really good because it holds an edge for a very long time, but it requires more maintenance. Um, you have to clean it and dry it immediately or it will rust. You have to oil it and all that good stuff. Yeah, get stainless steel. It's simpler. For, for your purposes, it's simpler. Um, honing steel. Not a sharpening steel. Uh, but do keep your knives clean. Don't just leave them, at, you know, cut something and then leave them on the cutting board overnight. Um, any sort of material, including just water on the knife, even though it's stainless steel, it can still corrode. And so it, there, there can be pitting, um, discoloration on the knife. It all, it, it all sort of ruins the knife. Um, keep, your not, keep your fingers curled under. Pinch the knife between thumb and forefinger when holding it to, keep, to maintain stability. Use an orbital motion for slicing. If you're chopping, it's going to be a different thing. And that's a different lesson. We'll talk about that some other time. But for most of what you're going to be doing, you're going to be slicing and dicing. And once you get good at using your basic knife, um, even just your kitchen knife, if you decide to use a paring knife for, for smaller things, great. Once you get good at it, um, a lot of those commercials that you see on TV for gadgets that promise to make it make cooking easier for you. Honestly, those uh, I'd say a strong 75 to 80 percent, if not more, of those products are targeted toward people who haven't mastered this. Just just this. This part right here and this part right here. I guarantee you, if you work on your knife skills, if you actually just get some carrots and just dice them up, make a soup or something, whatever, don't waste the carrots, but get some vegetables and just practice with your knife skills. Um, get better at them. I promise you, the need for the little bash and chop things, you know, the slap chop and the, the whatever, um, 
will go down considerably. Maybe not 100%. There are some gadgets that are handy. Um, things like mandolins and, and other specialized slicers for specific purposes. Um, spiralizers. That sort of cut is actually pretty difficult with a, re with a regular knife. So those sorts of things, sure, there are gadgets out there that maybe, maybe possibly you need um, if you want that, if you want that specific cut. But otherwise, if it's just for dicing stuff, slicing stuff, um, developing good knife skills is really 95% of the battle there. So get some good quality knives, take care of them, practice with them, get good with them. And that's really at least two thirds of cooking is prep work, is actually getting your ingredients prepared and in the shape um, that you want them to be so that you can apply heat to them. And then the rest of cooking is just applying heat in different ways to the ingredients that you've prepared. But I would say quite easily two thirds of the time that I spend cooking is just preparing the ingredients. Um, and then throwing it all together is easy. Not necessarily in comparison, but it's an easy, it's, it's just easy. Uh, it just takes time. And as you get better at it, it will take slightly less time. Don't rush. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And if there are enough of them, if I've left some, uh, enough out, I might do another video or I'll just answer them in the comments. But either way, please do comment. Let me know what you think. And let me know if there's uh, what direction you want me to go with some of these fundamentals videos. Um, I want to help you cook better um, or cook at all. <laughs> and I want you to explore just what you're capable of in the kitchen. So, until next time, I'm Mike Uyakin. Thanks for watching.